Let's bow in prayer. Gracious and loving God, your creative presence is at work each moment of each day, bringing life. Your eternal love is always near, seeking to draw us closer and closer to your heart. Help us to know your closeness each day. Help us to be open to you in a special way in these next few moments. And may you be pleased to use my words, all of our thoughts, all of our meditations, that through them and in spite of them, we might be drawn closer to you, gain an added measure of your truth and of your love. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> when I was a child, I remember traveling uh, to town from the farm in the old truck with, and talking about big things with my dad. I was maybe grade two. I commented that when I got big, I would um, then know everything. And my dad shocked me by saying, Miles, we never know everything. And then he said, you know your grandma and how old she is? And I nodded, for I thought my grandma was very ancient. <laughs> Although as I think about it now, she probably was only about 68, 69. Well, he said, even grandma, as old as she is, does not know everything. I was amazed. As I grew, I would learn more about that truth. We, we never know everything. And just because you know a lot, or have a, a, a lot of formal education, does not make you wise either. Wisdom and knowledge are different. We need both knowledge and wisdom. Well, today we are continuing what we began last week, reading from a, a very important type of scripture called wisdom literature. And wisdom literature is about a way of living that listens for, responds to, and practices the truths and the vision of God for a life that's meaningful, just, faithful, and life-giving. So today, which Lynn read for us, we hear pieces of this ancient, sacred tradition of wisdom literature that does appear and flows through the scriptures. So Proverbs 31 talks about the capable, what capable wife it's called, who is a hard worker, as you heard, who is a successful businesswoman, who is a woman who cares for and manages her household well. She's intelligent. She's skilled with the work of her hands. She's compassionate and generous to the needy. She's described in verse 25 as having strength and dignity as her clothing. In verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Now this amazing woman is praised, but also seems to embody the teaching of the book of Proverbs, which is about the spiritual and practical gift of divine wisdom. She summarizes all the teaching in her life. Psalm 1 today, which is a prayer hymn from the wisdom tradition, it reminds us that happiness is not about possessions, success, power over others, or any of the things we measure as success in the modern world. Rather, happiness is found in being wise and following the path or the teaching of the law of God. Verses 1 and 2 proclaim the mystery of true happiness. It says again, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. And then, in the New Testament, we come to James, and he continues the wisdom tradition as well by scolding and challenging early Christian communities to live as followers of Jesus Christ by listening for and then living out the law of God. Verse 13 of chapter 3 says it this way, Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. And later James is going to contrast earthly wisdom to spiritual wisdom. And his words seem very appropriate to me in a modern world where rhetoric, social media, and debate in society is often expressed through conflict, anger, or selfishness. Listen to verses 14 17 again. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above but it's earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. Does that sound familiar in the modern world? Verse 17 presents the contrast of the challenge. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. 
And then in the Gospel of Mark, we have the powerful, world-changing wisdom of God revealed in Jesus, presented in this little passage. So let's focus on the little passage of Mark today. In the story, Mark shows Jesus taking the closest disciples, which are probably the 12 apostles, and probably those few women who are always part of the inner circle. He takes them away from the familiar routine of ministry they've known with Jesus, and he begins a more challenging journey to Jerusalem. Actually, the gospel itself is divided in half. And the first half is about them learning and being in Galilee. The second half, which we start, is now their journey towards Jerusalem and the cross. And so Jesus guides them through Galilee, but away from the crowds. Jesus doesn't want others to know they are there or interfere with his special teaching for them. And he tells them that he, the Messiah, will be betrayed, killed, and rise again. And the response is stunned silence. Verse 37 says, But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Have you ever thought sometimes in life there are things that happen that challenges our assumptions about life and how it should be, and we're just rendered silent? We don't know what to say. We don't know how to respond. I would suggest that maybe in those moments that's a good thing. Because something important has happened. Our assumptions, maybe our blinders to uh, things in the world have been taken off. And we need time to come to terms with a new world that's before us. Just like in this passage. Jesus shocked his disciples into silence with this revelation. Because for them, the picture of a betrayed Messiah, a dead Messiah, was impossible. And the idea of a dead Messiah rising to life, nonsensical. They needed time to digest. Silence was a gift for them. Now, then it goes on. As they continue on the journey, it says they enter a house in Capernaum. Now, whenever Mark says there's a teaching or a meeting in the house, that means it's a special teaching just for the inner group, the inner circle, not meant for the crowds. It also means, in effect, he's saying, dear reader, pay attention. This is important teaching because it's in-house stuff. And while in the house, Jesus asks what they were arguing about on the way. We're told in verse 34, it says, But they were silent, for on the way they argued with one another about who was the greatest. See, they're silent because they feel guilty and ashamed, because they realize that this discussion they were having was coming from earthly wisdom, to use James' words, where they would describe the values of the world. They were operating on the values of the world about who can be on top, who can climb the ladder of success fastest. And who has the most power or prestige over others? And they know when Jesus asks them that they're guilty and ashamed. So Jesus responds to their silence by giving them an alternate vision of values. He tells them what's truly important. He tells them where greatness is found. And Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Now we've heard that all our lives. We say, oh, isn't that nice? But it's really a shocking, radical statement in Jesus' world. And the reason is because in the Roman Empire, in the culture of the time, servants, or another word for them as slaves, were the last and the least important in society. To be a servant or a slave in ancient Roman understanding was to be called a living tool that could be used by the master any way that master wanted to do it. Why would anybody want to be? a slave or a servant. And yet the wisdom of Jesus says that like the Messiah who will choose to give his life willingly even if it meant death on a cross, so God's wisdom, power, and alternate vision of life is found in willingly becoming the servant of others rather than dominating or having power over others. And the disciples are shocked in silence one more time in this passage as they try to digest this very radical teaching. So finally, Jesus brings in a child, we're told, into their midst. Now remember, in that time, a child had no economic, political, or social value in ancient Roman society. A child, like a slave, was the lowest rung uh, of value in the world. But Jesus again turns the wisdom of the world upside down, saying, you see this child here? I tell you that whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. 
You see, the wisdom of God that he's teaching is that how we treat the least powerful, the least popular, the most marginalized in life demonstrates our response to God. The wisdom is that God chooses to lift up the most vulnerable, forgotten, and weak in society and challenges the most powerful to give up their power in service to the powerless. Imagine if we paid attention to that radical spiritual wisdom of God today. Would there be the need for food banks for millions of Canadian families who often are working full-time jobs that don't provide enough for shelter, food, and the basics of life? Imagine if we paid attention to that radical spiritual wisdom of God today. Would there be prejudice, racism, and intolerance that often exists for those who do not look or act like the majority in society? Imagine if we pay attention to the radical spiritual wisdom of God, would there be indifference to the most vulnerable in our world, those who get left behind or forgotten by a fast-moving, technological, increasingly urban society. At Presbytery this week, we had that workshop we talked about, uh, advertised about uh, seniors being socially isolated. They represent the people that often get left behind. Technologically, and others of us struggle as well, how do you keep up to that? If you have health issues, or you've lost mobility, and you're more isolated, don't you get left behind? You get forgotten. I'm as guilty as others. If you haven't seen a person for many months, you suddenly could say, do they still live here? We forget. There are many vulnerable people, ordinary people, who get left behind in our fast-paced, technologically changing, uh, world. Imagine if we paid attention to the radical spiritual wisdom of God who lifts up and pays attention to the vulnerable. Would that happen? I think not. In our modern world, there are so many voices that shout to us with so-called truths, teaching, values, and insights. And we get overwhelmed. I do. I trust you do as well. In our modern world, many of society's truths are about getting ahead, caring only for ourselves, or about being fearful of others who are different. And you think about it, those values have nothing to do with the faith. They have nothing to do with God's spiritual wisdom. They have nothing to do with the teaching of Jesus. But in this noisy world of ours, maybe like the disciples in Mark today, we need to walk in silence sometimes and just allow that radical message of wisdom and Christ's teaching to disturb us, to confuse us, to challenge us, and then guide us to what's truly important in life, which is about living in faith. It's about caring for others. It's about practicing justice and peace and compassion. So if we are to take the world-changing wisdom of God seriously and, and let it touch us and let us stump us so we're silent for a while, how do we find it? Where do we look? Well, one of the ways to find this wisdom and meaning life, I would suggest, is not only in worship and listening to the words of Scripture. It's not only in prayer and seeking God's Spirit, but it's maybe to remember and reflect on our life. Think of your life and look back and ask, when did you experience God's wisdom? If you look, you probably did. Who were the people who taught you about what was truly great and important in life? What did they teach? Think back on those stories. And allow the wisdom to speak to you. Give you an example. I remember a time when I was young in elementary school, again, probably grade one, and I was coming home on the bus, and my bus driver said, Miles, your mom and dad phoned. They'd gone to Regina for business. They won't be home right away. So I'm to drop you off at Wilcox's, who were our closest neighbors. We called this couple Auntie Claire, Will, and Uncle Eddie. They were not relatives, but they were close friends. Now, they were a family who were not wealthy, they lived very modestly, as most of us did back then. They were quiet people, part of our local United Church. Auntie Clara was part of the UCW, and I think she might have been an assistant leader to CGIT, one of the girls' programs then. And I remember that it was in the days when they did not have a TV yet, although most of the neighborhood now did. So how would they entertain a little boy until his parents came home? Well, I remember vividly that Auntie Clara showed me her scrapbook of articles, pictures, 
programs from the United Church Observer and other church magazines that spoke about the mission of the church around the world and in Canada. And so in that afternoon, I heard and saw pictures about hospital chaplaincy and food for the hungry and building of schools in foreign lands and helping poor people develop skills that would lift them from poverty, stories about working with the poor in the very inner core of our cities. I didn't understand everything, but in her quiet, calm, modest, faithful way, which was her way, Andy Clairville opened up for me the whole world that day. And not only the world, but the purpose of the church and the faith. There were very little words used because that was her nature. She didn't have to convince me, she didn't have to preach to me about what a Christian was or what the church was to do or how great or how inadequate the church was. There was none of that preaching stuff. She simply showed me the church and faith in action. And by her respect and the time taken to put together that scrapbook, she imparted to me the importance of faith and what was truly important in life, caring for others. Auntie Clairville, in my mind, showed me greatness that day. Not only what was important in life, but how we as ordinary people, like she was, can live greatness by simply following Jesus and caring for others. Now, when we reflect and remember those people that you have in your life, like my Auntie Clairville from long ago, and you think about what they show us about who is the greatest and they show us the greatness which comes in all the simplicity and power, I think then we'll begin to discover the power of God's wisdom at work in the world and speaking to us. And after discovering God's wisdom, maybe we need to just be silent for a while. Like the disciples in Mark, and let the spirit and message of God's wisdom fill us. And once we're filled, then individually and as together as a church, get up and fall in the way of God's spiritual wisdom of serving others, welcoming the most vulnerable like a child, and so honoring God in all we say and do.